Good evening and welcome. I'm Greg Partain, a music professor and the current director of the Creative Intelligence Series. Our time tonight with uh, our speaker is very precious, but before we bring Hannah Drake to the podium, I'd like to alert you to a trilogy of exciting on-campus speaking events that are on the horizon so that you can mark all three down on your calendar. So first, immediately after spring break, poet Joy Harjo will present this year's Keenan Lecture. Harjo is serving her third term as the U.S. Poet Laureate, and she's the first Native American to hold that title. Uh, her talk is on Wednesday, March 23rd at 7 p.m. in Hagen Auditorium. And we hope you attend in person, but that will be live streamed as well. So one week later, journalist and author Jill Levy will visit campus to speak to us about her work covering the U.S. criminal justice system and her book, Ghetto Side, which is an international bestseller. Uh, Levy's talk is on Thursday, March 31st, also at 7, and that one's over in Cowgill. And then three weeks after spring break, Creative Intelligence will present a Transylvania faculty panel entitled Enduring Knots, Reflections on Bridging Chasms. And that will feature professors Leslie Ribovich, Melissa Fortner, Priya Anand, Gary Deaton, and Peter Fossil. And that session will take place right here in Carrick Theater on Wednesday, April 6, also at 7 p.m. So now to tonight, uh, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the talk and then a book signing right here on stage. Uh, so know that you can text your questions in at any time. I hope those of you in person picked up a card with a number. If you didn't, we'll announce it later. Um, if you're joining us remotely, you'll find that number in the chat. So Lindsay Steffen, Transylvania student body president, is going to introduce us now to our speaker. Um, a senior, Lindsay is a double major, uh, majoring in English and writing rhetoric and communications in preparation for law school. Among the many activities she's involved with on campus, she serves as a Transylvania admissions ambassador, a first engagements coordinator, a writing center staffer, and a flutist in the concert band. So please let's welcome Lindsay to the stage. Good evening, you all. Um, I have the honor of introducing Louisville author, poet, spoken word artist, blogger, public speaker, and social justice leader, Hannah L. Drake. Allow me to share just some of her many achievements and successes. Drake has written 11 books, which range from commentary on politics, feminism, race, allyship, and our intersectionality to fiction and poetry. Her most recent book is titled, Dear Women, It's Not You, It's Me. I'm breaking up with you. She also writes a popular blog and produces a podcast, which offers commentary on current events. In 2019, during Super Bowl Sunday, Drake's poem, All You Had to Do Was Play the Game, was highlighted by former San Francisco 49ers quarterback, Colin Kaepernick. The poem has been viewed more than two million times. Drake's work has been featured online at Cosmopolitan, The Bitter Southerner, The Lily, Harper's Bazaar, and Revolt TV. In 2021, her work as an activist and poet was profiled in the New York Times. Hannah L. Drake demands social change, promotes education, and offers support to fellow authors and activists through her many publications, works, and lectures. Because of her impassioned work, she was named a Daughter of Greatness by the Muhammad Ali Center, a distinction given to prominent women engaged in social philanthropy, activism, and pursuits of justice. She was also named one of the best of the best in Louisville, Kentucky for her poem spaces and recently was honored as a Kentucky Colonel, the highest title of honor bestowed by the Kentucky governor for noteworthy accomplishments and outstanding service to community, state, and nation. To echo the sentiments of poet Robin G regarding Drake's work, quote, even when she whispers, people listen. She has the uncanny ability to speak in a language that everyone, no matter their background, income, a race can comprehend. She speaks the language of humanity, 
end quote. I can say with confidence her words have already moved me, and my sincerest hope is that she speaks to your heart as well. Please join me in giving Hannah L. Drake a very warm welcome. It is difficult to stand in spaces, spaces that weren't designed for me, spaces that were not created for people that looked like me, spaces that scream, you do not belong here, spaces that feel like sandpaper against my blackness, coarse and rough and painful and uneasy. Spaces that are void of signs, but still I can see them hanging in a not so distant memory. Signs that separated water fountains and restaurants, blatantly reminding people that these spaces were not made for them. And although the signs no longer remain, the architecture and atmosphere is constructed in such a way that I know and we know that these are not our spaces. We are simply standing in borrowed time to entertain the master's masses. It is difficult to stand in these spaces and be me, fully me. Code switching my vernacular to make you feel comfortable. Why must my life dress itself up in discomfort for you to feel at ease? Why must my hair look a certain way in these spaces? Why is my gender an issue in these spaces? Why does my skin feel so heavy in these spaces? You see, these are spaces I no longer want to reside in. I do not enjoy being in these spaces. I no longer want to subject myself to these spaces, but then I am reminded. As I stand in these spaces and I see the faces of these two little black girls watching me perform in awe, because I am a woman with kinky hair like them and skin that looks like theirs and lips that look like they're standing in these spaces. Spaces that have been designed in ways that have spoken to them at an early age, reminding them, baby, some spaces just ain't for your kind. You see that? It's why I'm in these spaces, being a shout in these spaces. It is for every Black person that has ever entered a room and wondered, would anyone look like them in these spaces? It is for every LGBTQ person that has wondered, could they safely be themselves in these spaces? It is for every woman that has stood at the head of a boardroom table wondering, would she be considered equal in these spaces? It is for every Muslim woman that has wondered, could she wear her hijab in these spaces? You see, I remember those that stood in spaces not made for them, that marched on roads not paved for them, that sat down on seats and buses not earmarked for them, that sat down at counters and endured the humiliation of sitting in spaces so that one day I too could stand in these spaces. You see, that is why I'm in these spaces. It is for everyone that came before me, that sipped water at the colored only fountain, that marched into integrated schools and knew they would be just one of nine. It is for every black performer that stood on stages so that one day little black kids could know that they too could dance on stages. It is for my mother, my mother, that stood in the space of a cotton field picking cotton for 80 cents a day. It is for everyone that will come after me for them to know that they have a right to be in these spaces, to have a seat at the table, in these spaces to have a voice, in these spaces to have influence, in these spaces you see that is why I stand in these spaces even when it makes me uncomfortable. And now some of you sit looking at me and now you feel uncomfortable. But today you have heard me. You cannot unsee me. In this space I belong. In this space, we are here, and we belong here, in this space. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. I'm going to get right into it. Are we gonna laugh a little bit? We might cry a little bit. I might cry a little bit. 
it's okay, right? It's all good. <laughs> Did you all get a little piece of plastic? Did I give you all a little piece? Everybody got a little piece of plastic. Okay. So I'm going to tell you about the little piece of plastic when I tell you all this story, but y'all going to get it, okay? <laughs> so I will start with this story, and we're just going to walk our way through it. So in 2016, I had the opportunity to travel to Dakar, Senegal. And I was 39 years old. It was the first time that I had gotten a passport, the first time I was leaving America. I never left America before. And the very first place that I was going was Dakar. And the week that I was scheduled to leave, I was going with this group called uh, Roots and Wings. So it was a group of about 10 uh, performance artists and we were all black and we were all going to Dakar to learn uh, about art and history. And then we were coming back to Louisville, Kentucky to write a play about what we experienced. And the week that I was leaving, uh, I went on Facebook and um, I saw Philando Castile's girlfriend had gone live and he had been shot by the police. And I remember she was driving and he was in the passenger seat and he had on a white t-shirt. And you could see the blood start to pool across his shirt. And his girlfriend was saying, I know you just didn't kill him. And they separated the girlfriend and her daughter who was in the back seat and put them in the back of a police car. And there was a camera on. So in this police car, you could see the daughter who looked to be about eight or nine. And she was saying, mommy, it's going to be OK. But indeed, we know now that it wasn't OK because Philando Castile was killed. And that same week, Alton Sterling was shot by the police as well, and he was selling CDs outside of a convenience store and was shot in the chest by the police, and someone had videotaped that and placed it on Facebook as well. So in two, in two days, I watched the murder of two a black men by the police, and I was ready to leave. And everybody was asking me, Hannah, what is it you want to say? As a writer and poet, they were looking for me to say something, and I didn't have anything to say. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know uh, what I could tell people to make it feel any better. And I didn't have anything to say. I was just ready to go. So I get on this airplane, and a part of me felt a little guilty to leave. I felt like I was leaving people, and they had so many questions. They were looking to me for answers, and I didn't have any answers. But I got on the plane, and my daughter was able to go on this trip with me. Um, and the minute I stepped foot into Senegal, something inside of me felt like you're home. This felt right. I felt like I belonged in this space. I didn't know why. But as soon as my foot hit the ground, I knew you, something's different here. You belong here. And I started touring and visiting everything that I could in Senegal. And I recall my friend, Cynthia, who was on the trip, she's a dancer. We went to a little shop and we were so used to shopping while black in America. So we were buying earrings and we we're like holding them out and like, we don't want someone to think we're trying to steal and we're not trying to steal anything. And we went to pay for them. And when we went to pay for them, we realized that the shop owner was outside of the shop and she wasn't thinking about us. And it dawned on me for the first time in my entire life, it wasn't a crime to be black. I could just exist. And I had never felt that before. And I was going to be there for two weeks. So it was 20,160 minutes of my time, my life that I had, right? So I bought this jar with these little pieces of plastic in it. 
and I wanted 20,160 pieces of little plastic. So every little piece of plastic you all have is a minute of this life of freedom that I had never experienced before. And I want you all to keep that little piece of plastic because many of us walk around and we never think about living free. And you never really think about driving while black or how you hold something in a store. But that little piece of plastic you each have symbolically a minute and I was gonna hold on to every one of those minutes because I knew I was gonna have to come back to America. But in that minute, when the shop owner wasn't paying attention to me, it was like the world opened up to me and I could finally see the world in color. And it was like the world said, Hannah, we have been waiting for you. So I started taking pictures of everything. I took pictures of the art, the water, fish, graffiti, billboards, anything that I could find that looked like me. It was the first time I went to a church and the angels had braids and their noses looked like mine and their lips looked like mine. And there was stained glass all around the church of the disciples and they were all black. And I'd never seen disciples and stained glass with black people in my entire life, 39, almost 40. I know I look good, I look good, Donna. But I, <laughs> almost 40 years old, I'd never seen it in my entire life. And finally I saw representation of me so I started taking pictures of all the angels, all of the artwork. I was just amazed that everywhere I went, something looked like me. And when you don't have to think about that, in America, you never think about it, right? Because typically, everything looks like you. do not look like me. But everywhere I went, everything looked like me. And this was such a new feeling. So I was going to enjoy it. There was one part of this trip that I believe was kind of setting the course of my life at that time. And we were going to Gorey Island. And it is the last stop where Africans were captured and held before they were put on ships and brought to America. And you take a ferry to Godre Island and we were on this ferry and you could hear a pin drop. And they had shut Godre Island down that day for us to come inside and see. They call it a slave castle. It's really not a castle like we think castle like in a Disney movie or something, but it is um, a complete stone and it's two stories. And inside of the building are some rooms. And the rooms are labeled uh, men, women, infants, young girls. And there's a room for people that would disrupt. And above all of those rooms is where uh, the people that would be taking them to America would be. And so immediately when they caught Africans, they would separate families immediately, separate them into these rooms. And so I went in the room for people that would resist because I'm thinking, okay, if I'm here, I'm probably going to be the, a resistor. And my, <laughs> yeah, I'm probably, yeah. And my daughter uh, went into the room for young girls. And of course, back then, of course, there's no insulation, no anything like that. It's complete stone. And in this room is a window. And when I say window, it's not a window like we imagine. It's about two inches wide and you can look out of this space. And so I asked the curator of the museum, how many people can fit in these spaces? And he said, it doesn't matter. It didn't matter to them. What mattered is that they could close this door. And if bodies were on top of bodies, it didn't matter. And they would remain there until the ship came for them to get on the ship. 
And so my daughter was in the room for young girls and she started crying. And it was a cry from her that I had never heard come from my daughter ever. And because of this space, it echoed in this castle and it filled up the space. And then I started walking to what they call the door of no return. And this is the door, of course, where uh, Africans would go through this door and presumably would never return back home. And I stood in that door of no return and I looked at the water and I tried to imagine what it would feel like to be separated from my daughter, to get on this ship, not know where I was going. It's kind of difficult for us to think about that now because we are so used to being connected. But of course, in that time, there is no email. You're not gonna tweet somebody. It's just, you're there and where am I going? Where are you dropping me off to? I don't know what's happening. And I stood looking out at that water and I could hear my daughter wailing in this room. And I wondered, what does the other side of this look like in the South? And I'd read books, we've all read books, but I'd never seen it before. And I thought, I have to get to the other side. And I knew immediately, my spirit said, Hannah, you need to go to Mississippi. And I thought, nah, nah, I don't. You know, <laughs> not me. You know, so I start Googling Mississippi and, and I thought, no, nah, I don't, I don't think that's going to be a good trip. You know, <laughs> so after I had, uh, I come back to America, right? After this visit, come back to America. And the minute we landed in New York, we land in New York, we're going to go to New York to Indy to come back to Kentucky. I was immediately depressed because I knew I'm back to being black in America and I'm back to worrying about my hair and how I look in space and how much space I take up and driving while black and shopping while black and all, all the stuff, right, that I didn't have to think about for 20,160 minutes of freedom in my life, that little piece of plastic y'all have. I didn't have to think about that and now I was back to it again. So I'm back to being black in America. So then I went home and I closed my blind and I was like, I'm depressed and I ain't going to work, but then I had bills. And so I had to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and so I get to work, I'm working at a place called Ideal Sex Lab. And they said, Hannah, we got a grant. I'm like, that's great. What's good? Go, go sit there. And I think you need to go to Mississippi. And I thought, what? No, I don't. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. You, you need to go to Mississippi and you're going to work with a group of young girls called Girls and Pearls. And they're telling the story of history and heritage in Natchez, Mississippi. Never even heard of Natchez, Mississippi. But I was going. So then I immediately started Googling, right? Let me get the stats on Natchez, Mississippi. And I was scared. And there was a tour guide there named Jeremy Houston. There are two black tour guides in Natchez, Mississippi. He's one of them. So they connected me with him. And I was going to Natchez to meet him, to meet these young women. And he said, Hannah, when you fly here, you have to fly into Baton Rouge. You can't fly into Natchez. You're flying to Baton Rouge. And you have to drive from Baton Rouge to Natchez. And he said, when you fly in and start driving here, do not drive through Jackson, Mississippi, because I cannot guarantee your safety. Drive straight here, don't stop anywhere. And my daughter was with me. We flew into, well, I ain't gonna lie, we stopped in New Orleans and did a few things for her. And then, and then, we, <laughs> and then, <laughs> then we got in the car <laughs> and started heading to Natchez. And I never, really even discuss this, right? When I talk about this, never discuss it, but this is the reality of being black in America. And I believe this was 2017. 
that we had formulated a plan, even if we had to go to the bathroom, of what we are going to do because we are not stopping along these roads in Mississippi. That's the reality. In 2017, we're gonna work this situation out. And when I started driving, I was clutching the steering wheel and I was afraid. And you could see the road change from asphalt to gravel, like you're going back in time. And I could tell, okay, we must be getting closer because I started seeing the flags and the cotton fields. And as far as my eyes could see, I could see cotton. And finally, we made it to Natchez and I just breathed a sigh of relief that we had made it in one piece. And I met up with Jeremy, I met the young women and we would work with the young women in the day and finally, I told Jeremy, Jeremy, I need to start visiting the plantations. I need to see them. And I need to see the cotton fields. And, you know, I've only known plantations from on TV, right? You see on TV, you might read the book. So I thought, okay, we're just going to go visit it. And he said, oh, no, no, Hannah, you don't understand. Those are their homes. They still live in them. They have just passed them down in their family. And I'm thinking, this isn't like a museum type situation. He's, no, no. He said, there are some that you can visit. You have to pay to visit them, which I thought, I shouldn't have to pay to visit any of those. But okay. <laughs> but, okay. But, he's, <laughs> but he said, no, 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 you don't understand. They still live there. These are still their homes but the ones that you can visit, I will take you to. And my daughter and I started touring the plantation and they are set up in such a way that absolutely nothing has changed. They still have the furnishings, they still have the bedding, they still have the dishes and it's all fine china. And on this table, I'll never forget on this table, there was a casserole dish and the knob was shaped like a cotton ball and it was solid gold. The chandeliers were solid gold. Everything was stunning. These were mansions and not just, I mean, huge, huge homes. The land out front, huge. And in one home, they had bells everywhere. And I said, what is this? And Jeremy said, that's a system where when a different type of bell what would ring, then they knew what to bring inside the house. And there were doors everywhere where enslaved people were to hardly be seen and certainly not heard, where they would bring things into the house and sneak out of these doors. So finally, I toured probably three or four of these homes. And I finally made it to the last one. And there was another black tour guide there. And he starts showing me all around the home. And there was a woman with him that helped curate this home. And I asked, I told her, well, this all looks real nice. After a while, it all starts looking alike, right? It's a nice big home. Okay, I get it. And I said, well, take me where I would have been because I, I seen this. Where, where I wouldn't have been in here. So take me where I would have been. And she said, oh, we tore all that down. You know, in some of the buildings, we just bricked over and turned into offices. It's all gone. And I thought, just like that, you just brick over history. Pretend it never happened. It's just gone. A piece of me is just gone. And so I said, okay. So we went back in the house, and the other tour guide took me around, and he said, Hannah, let me show you this uh, kitchen, the dining room area. And above the table, I'd never seen this before, was this huge fan. And I said, what is that? And he said, it's called a punka. And there was a string attached to it. And I said, uh, what is that for? And he said, an enslaved child would typically be in the corner pulling this string and the fan would go back and forth over the table to keep flies off the food. And I was so hurt 
that someone would be enslaved to pull a string to keep flies off food. And I just started crying. I just stood in that dining room and started crying. And the tour guide said, Hannah, don't weep for her, which I didn't understand. But he said, don't weep for her because she has a very important job. He said, when people are around the table eating, they talk. And her job is to stand in that corner and listen to anything that is said around that table and to go back and to tell her mother on the chance that they have an opportunity to escape. And after I heard that, I knew it was time for me to go to the cotton fields. So I went to Frogmore Plantation, still a working plantation, 1,800 acres of cotton. And I asked the person that runs the plantation, well, show me the bags that enslaved people had to fill with cotton. And I'd never seen it before, right? And my mother had told me stories of her being in the fields from nine to 12. So three years of her life, she was picking cotton for 80 cents a day and filling up this bag that I'd never seen. My mother hardly ever talks about this. She's 71 years old. And I said, well, show me the bag. I want to see it. And can you come here for a second, Greg, real quick? Can you come here real quick? And so I said, show me. And she did. And I wanted to see, what does this bag look like? And she's told me it's three feet wide and seven feet tall. And this is what you have to fill up. And I said, how much cotton can fit in that bag? And she said, 70 pounds. And I said, well, how much was required to be picked today? And she said, two to 300 pounds a day. And this is what they had to fill up. And when I thought about that, I went online and I got the, the specs for the bags and I just replicated them and made them. And this is exactly what it would look like. And I took that bag and screen printed images of my niece and me and my daughter and my friend on the bags. And then I started looking for women named Hannah because I wanted to find them. Because when I asked my mother, what is your grandmother's name that would take you to the cotton field? She said, Hannah, I can't remember. We used to just call her Mamie. And I said, do you remember anyone besides your grandmother? And she said, no. And I knew the story of my mom, my history was lost in those cotton fields. And I had to start finding these women named Hannah because I knew somehow in finding them, I would find myself. If you wanna put that on there so you don't have to hold it, that's perfectly fine. So, so I did that and I started looking for these women. This is always so difficult to read. A bill of sale, Timothy Burnham to John Norman, a woman by the name of Hannah, age 26, and her child. A bill of sale, H.A. Moore to Archibald, a woman by the name of Hannah, age 36, price $450. Amelia County, Virginia, during his lifetime, Benjamin Hendrick was seized and possessed of a considerable real and personal estate. In 1777, he bequeathed to his son Bernard one Negro woman named Hannah and her increase in his plantation and house and 300 acres of land. From a sense of being and my duty, I, Benjamin Dancy, do hereby emancipate and set free the following Negroes, reserving the service of one of those 
under the age of 21 and another until 18, Hannah, age nine. This is the poem that I wrote for all of those women named Hannah. If I close my eyes, I can see them. And if I quiet myself, I can hear them. Their voices carry on the wind like the tune from the chimes floating on a distant breeze. Who are you? And where did you come from? When you dream, what did you dream of? What is your story? What was your name before they gave you that name? What's the name passed down through our family? Am I your descendant? I stare at my face and I wonder if I look like you. I try to put faces to shadows. Can I find pieces of your memory in cotton fields and red mud? Scattered bones in unmarked graves that attempt to erase you from history. But you were here. You were always here. You existed. Unknown, no longer. I found your name. I found you. And in finding you, I found me. And I knew immediately, like that enslaved girl that stood in the corner, that my job was to go back and tell the story. I wasn't sure how that would look, but something, once again, here I go, getting on the road. I saw that there was this memorial opening in Alabama, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, Brian Stevenson opening this memorial. And I had to go see it. I saw it on TV and I thought, oh, this is interesting. I must go here. And in order to be, they have these pillars hanging, the names of the states and the counties and the names of people that were lynched in these counties. And I don't know why I was so drawn to this, but I just knew I had to be there. Once again, me and my daughter in a car driving to Alabama, holding on tight. <laughs> but we made it. We made it there. And I was determined to take a picture of every pillar that bore the name Kentucky. In order to be listed in this museum, your state had to lynch over 100 people. Kentucky has lynched that they know of 168. Eight of them are labeled as unknown. I took a picture of every pillar and I just started weeping in that memorial. And what struck me is how could eight people be listed in history as unknown? They had a name at some point, they had a parent. Their parents didn't label them unknown. So how are they now just labeled as unknown and I wanted to find them? So I went to the museum, it's close by to the lynching memorial, I bought a notebook and in this notebook, I just wrote two words, the unknown project. And I came back to Kentucky and as life would have it, I had a meeting with Rachel, my friend Rachel Platt at the Fraser Museum. And she said, Hannah, have you ever heard of this enslaved couple called the Blackburns? And I said, no, I don't know them. Tell me about them. She said, well, they escaped from Louisville. They were enslaved in Louisville and escaped and went to Canada. And I said, I don't know this story. So I started Googling. And as I read about them, they never had any children. No one knows how they look. And there was a line in this article that said anything else about them is virtually unknown. And I knew immediately that I was gonna start looking for the names of enslaved people in Kentucky. And so the Frazier, myself, Roots 101 all got together. We started collaborating on this project called the Unknown Project. And I'll never forget, I went online on Twitter. I'm telling you, if you don't follow me on Twitter, you're missing it, or Facebook. <laughs> and I told people, if your family enslave people, come clean and release the names. 
And slowly but surely, people started coming to me in NDMs, sending me messages and saying, Hannah, these are the stories. And indeed, my family did enslave people, and these are their names. So far, we have discovered over 150 names. We just started last year. But these are now 150 names that are a part of Kentucky history. 150 names that we can now say are unknown no longer. Now they are released to history and the families. When I sit and speak to these families, I said, it's 2022. No one thinks that you enslaved anybody. The problem is not in you having these names. The problem is that you're not releasing them. And you're not releasing them because you're ashamed. But there is no shame in what your family has done in 2022 because it's not you. The shame is in knowing the truth and hiding it. And this woman came to me and she said, Hannah, I want to give you something. It was a ledger. She said, this has been on my bookshelf since 1960. In it are the names of 50 people that were enslaved in Kentucky. And I've held on to this for years and I didn't know what to do with it until I heard about your project. And so now we have 50 names and they're called the Stites Negroes. We have their names, their ages. That's the beauty of telling the truth. That's the beauty of releasing the names that these people are unknown no longer. They're no longer a secret. They can show up in this space, in this space in history and say that I was here, I belong here, I existed, and you cannot hide me anymore because the blood will always cry out. The bones will always rattle. People will always want to be heard. People will always want to be acknowledged, even in death. That is one of my challenges for you all tonight. One, I want you to think about how you exist in space, how you show up in space, and please don't take that for granted. And two, if you have the names, release them, give them back to history. These people were enslaved in life, and at the very least, we can set them free in death. Thank you. Hannah, thank you for your generosity and thank your you. honesty. Thank you. Um, so we are going to take a few minutes for questions that you can text in. <laughs> Um, those of you in the hall, I hope you picked up a card with the number. Did, are, is there anyone who doesn't have that number? Okay. And at home, uh, the number is posted in the chat box. Uh, now, Lindsay is going to handle this part. So, Lindsay, if you'd like to come on up. Um, what would you like me to do with this? All right, if you all need the number, it's 859-429-1452. All right, so I have my first question. Um, are you hopeful for this country? If so, where do you find hope? You know, I am hopeful for this country. If, I think if we don't have hope, then what do we have? I have to believe that uh, this country can get better. I have a, a book called uh, Dear America, I'm Still Rooting For You. You know, I still believe in the goodness of people. You know, America just consists of people. So I still believe in the goodness of of people that people can get this thing right, you know, um, 
truthfully, I don't know if it will be in my lifetime, but I, t I tell people all the time that sometimes your job is to plant the seed, right? You plant the seed. Some, well, somebody tills the ground, somebody plants the seed. You take care of what grows and then somebody else enjoys the harvest. I may not be here to see the harvest, but I'm not gonna stop planting seeds. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how can people find if their families own slaves to release those names? And then how do they get those names to the Unknown Project? Typically, you know, here's the thing, when I get these names that I tell people, Dr. King said this so well, our, you know, our lives are inescapably intertwined, right? So my history is connected to, to white people. There's no getting around that. That's just the history of America. Nine times out of 10, what I have found is somebody in the family has the name. Somebody in the family knows the truth. The people who submitted the names to me, um, they weren't through any deep uh, genealogical research. They went to their Bibles. They went to paperwork that was in the house. They, you know, like the person that had the ledger. Uh, most people, one, one woman uh, messaged me on Twitter. She said, my family tells a story all the time about how my, like, my great, great, great uncle or something fell in love with a black woman and had, uh, she had two children. She said, that's not truthful. You know, she, he enslaved her. So how is it fall in love and have children? She said, that's not what happened. The woman's name is Eve, and here's the will. I want you to know the truth of what happened and to tell her story. I was so moved by Eve's story, this black woman that had three children. On his dying bed, he emancipated her, gave her $50 and the bed that he died in. This is what he left to her in the will. Her name is etched on the unknown project because I wanted people to remember a black woman named Eve who did not fall in love with her slave master, but who was in fact assaulted and had two or three children by him. But I believe that families have the paperwork. It is something that many families don't want to talk about, but it is certainly there. And if you find that you have it, you know, people have DM'd me on Twitter and on Facebook, but certainly you can go to uh, the Unknown Project KY and submit the information, photos, names, locations. Um, you know, I, I, I will take the information any way that I can get it. However they send it, I'm, I'm gonna take it. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question you actually answered, but I still want you to hear it. So um, when we think about the last couple of years in Louisville, it's hard not to give in to despair. What gives you hope? So I guess if you have anything specific to other um, natives to Louisville, um, to share. If I have anything specific to other world. Yeah, um, I guess regarding um, Louisville. Yeah, so, you know, Louisville uh, it, it was, mm. <laughs> You know, I'm not, I need, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Louisville certainly does have its challenges. I write about Louisville often. Uh, I just wrote a blog about Breonna Taylor, of course, March 13th. It's the second anniversary. It's a sad, it's have to be an anniversary, right, of Breonna Taylor's murder. And uh, people ask me, what have we gained? And in Louisville, we've gained nothing. What have we lost? You know, people have lost the ability, even if it was small, to feel safe in their homes. You know, uh, every time, and I was at the protest, I was tear gassed. You know, if they tear gassed me, they will tear gas anybody. And they tear gassed me, honey. And <laughs> so they did. And, uh, but every, every time I'm downtown, I remember that. Um, and something in Louisville has broken. And um, I believe that leadership in Louisville wants to kind of get on to the next thing. You don't get on to the next thing without healing what you have broken. And so Louisville needs to work on dealing with uh, what it has broken. Yeah, so we, we have some, some challenges. You know, that's the only, the nice way I can put it, so y'all invite me back. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, how do I help white people recognize that they are taking up space and even when they believe, oh, and even when they believe that they are sharing space, they are not? Yeah, often, you know, a lot of white people think they're sharing space and they're not. That's just the reality. Just keep it real, y'all. That's the truth. And, so, <laughs> and I think uh, you, you point it out, you know, you point it out. 
and, and sometimes that's not easy, right? And what I would like for white people to do is to let, let me give you all an example. So I saw online, there was a, a on Twitter again, y'all better follow me, uh, <laughs> uh, an advertisement for cyberbullying, right? Well, you, got, you all can imagine how black women, indigenous women, women of color are, are uh, cyber bullied. You know, I'm bullied all the time. I just, my block game is it's tight. You know, I block all day long, you know? <laughs> but it's always, you know, it's always hate mail. It's always the stuff. But on the flyer for white women, right? And so what would it look like if one of those white women on the flyer just said, I recognize that there are voices that should be in this space that aren't in this space, that I'm going to yield my space to somebody else. Now, the problem with that is often you must give up something. So you're going to give up being on the panel and the thing, right? But you have to think of the greater good what can we all get out of this if more voices are represented in the space? So it's really a challenge when you just look around and it just takes a little bit of looking around to say, who is not in here that should be in here? That's it. That's just the question you have to ask yourself. And we all can do it. Because this is the thing that I tell people all the time when I talk about privilege. Everybody has a level of privilege. It, I know we talk about white privilege a lot, and that's true. But I'm just saying in general, everybody has something. You know, I have a car. I have a home. That's a privilege. Everybody didn't have that. So even as a black woman, there is a pri I have some privilege. So nobody, no one is browbeating people for privilege. Like nobody, I tell people all the time, this is like a, a us being mad at Blue Ivy because her parents are rich. She didn't pick that. We all would have said, but hey, I want my mom to be Beyonce and Jay-Z too. You know, so, you know, I mean, who would who would I want my mom to be Oprah, you know. So, you know, she didn't pick that. She can't help it. It's just what she was born into. And there is a lot of privilege Blue Ivy's going to get because her mom is Beyonce and her dad is Jay-Z. Period. No one's hating on Blue Ivy. Well, I might be hating a little because it ain't me. But, <laughs> but y'all, ain't nobody hating on, on, on Blue Ivy because of who her parents. She couldn't pick it. White people don't pick being white. So nobody's upset because you have a little privilege. The thing is, how do you use it? That's the thing, because before, see, here's the thing. We don't even get to the user part, because the very first thing I grew up on, too, I did, I did, and you can't even get to that part, because it's always this compare. No one's mad. No, I, look, if you are rich, great. How are you going to help me? How you gonna, <laughs> how are you going to help others? If you are in the space, who are you going to invite in? I don't care that you're in the space. Great. Let's work I have to do. Invite me in. If you're already in. So that's the thing. No one cares about your privilege. Great. Use it. Use it to the advantage of others, to help others. That's how you make change. That's how you make the world a better space. And sometimes it means I am going to decrease so somebody else can increase. Is that, is that a thing we can do sometimes? Can we do that? Can we just decrease sometimes? You ain't got to be the loudest, smartest one in the room all the time. Let somebody else in. Then what I tell people when you get in the room, you know how people always say, hold the door open. Take the damn door off. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, so many, I'm going to kind of combine these two questions since they're a little kind of similar. All right, so the first one is, um, our state le legislature is trying to pass a gag order on teaching this sort of history and hard treats. Do you have thoughts on how we should be challenging this sort of censorship? And teach a history, real history? That's um, I think our state legislature is trying to pass a gag order on teaching this sort of history and hard treats. I think they might be referring to CRT. Yeah, that no one can define. So here's okay. the first thing. Anybody in the says CRT, I ask, well, what is that? You know, just stop right there. Let's have that kind of, what that, tell me what that means. You know, here's the thing. And you can write your state legislator 
And I'm just going to not say anything else about that. Because <laughs> you can write or call. You know, when you have a super majority, y'all can, pre it's pretty much done, right? And so, <laughs> so you can write, call, email, whatever. But I still feel for the people, continue to speak the truth, right? The thing about young people, this is what people in office didn't bank on. They ain't bank on the internet, right? <laughs> so you, you young people, y'all's age, little young, you're walking around with a whole computer in your head. For the most part, the majority of us have one of these. I could get to it somehow. We can get to the internet somehow, you know? And look at, question everything. Look it up. Ask why. Well, why is that? Well, let me Google. Well, let me read that. Well, what book is that? In? And share what you learn. The truth is what we have to do is understand that black history is history. It's simply history. It's simply what happened in America. History isn't a buffet. You know, you go through a buffet. Well, I'll take a little salad, then I think I might want a piece of rib, then I might get a roll. No, no, you're eating the whole thing. And some of it you may not like, and some of it's not pretty, but it's all important for the whole meal, right? And so I think it's important for young people and everybody keep speaking the truth. And I spoke about this earlier about reframing the way we talk about history in America. And I saw online, someone said the problem when we talk about slavery is we talk about it as if it's black history, when it's really white history, right? And then when we talk about segregation, we talk about, well, you know, black people weren't allowed to drink from the fountain because they were black. No, they weren't allowed to drink from water fountains because of policies that they didn't enact. Other people did. That's reality. None of that's made up. It's, you, you, you don't get to skip over. That's not how it works. You know, I tell people, if someone is trying to hide something from you, ask yourself why. Thank you. All right. Um, I think that that sort of covered the next question that was sort of sectioned under that, which was, what ways can we be better allies in Kentucky? But I just got another question. Um, Someone is asking, will you please read your work, Colin Kaepernick? <laughs> Who's asking? No. <laughs> anonymous? This is anonymous. <laughs> I can't. I'm going to pull it out. That's why I got out my phone because I normally don't have out my phone, but I got it out because I knew. Uh, but as far let me, while I'm pulling this up, as far as allies, let me tell you something about being an ally real quick. Don't dangle allyship in the face of black people and people of color like it's a carrot, okay? If you're gonna be an ally, be an ally. It's not I'm gonna be an ally till I get back to brunch or hot yoga or wine with my friends, right? If you're gonna be an ally, you gotta, it's not a fair with a friend ally. It's all the time, in the trenches all the time. It's not when the cameras are out, it's not for the Instagram, I'm gonna do it for Graham, get the picture and I'm gonna pull hashtag BLM, no. It's all the time. People ask me, Hannah, how long are we going to have to talk about race? Every day. Every day. Every single day. Well, how long are you going to talk about race? Until people stop being racist. So we're going to do it every day. Right? <laughs> right? It's like working out. When you start working out, every day. Every day. If you start eating healthy, how, how long you got to eat healthy? Every day. If you want to be healthy and maintain. Every single day. So please know, you know, if there's no short cut through justice. It is going to be every single day, pretty much, okay? And be, be an ally. One thing I hate to hear from allies is, you know, I, 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 you know I'm, I'm done with that, you know, and, and y'all made me angry. Y'all hurt my feelings. I don't feel I'm going to take my ally toys home. You know, no. If you're going to do that, you was never really an ally because sometimes I'm going to say something that upsets you, you know, but a real friend, sometimes has to say things to you that upset you, am I right? That's a friend, that's a real friend. It's gonna say, no, no, you got that wrong. Let me tell you how you can get it right. 
And then it's not I'm taking my toys home. It's let me stick through this thing. Let me walk through the fire with you. That's what friendship is. If you can't do that, don't walk with me because sometimes it's going to be hard and it's not going to feel good and it's not going to be on the front page of the paper and it's not going to be about Instagram and Twitter and it's not going to be about an interview and a thing. It's just going to be plugging away at it every single day, period. So that's about allyship. Had to get that out real quick. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this poem, you know, I'll really explain poetry because I think poetry speaks for itself. So, but this poem is a tough poem. You know, I told them earlier, sometimes you use, as a writer, you use a sledgehammer or you use a chisel. Uh, I chose to use a sledgehammer. Right. <laughs> so, so this was about Colin Kaepernick, and I was whew, so tired of how they were talking about Kaepernick and the flag and Kaepernick, and, and his, his, his protest was hijacked, right? Kaepernick was kneeling clearly to draw attention to police brutality. It had nothing to do with patriotism. In fact, it was a patriot who said, why don't you kneel? Right, I'd say leave that out the story, that part, you know. Uh, uh, and so it became a thing. It became an entirely different narrative for Colin Kaepernick. So I wrote this piece. It's called uh, Dear Colin Kaepernick. All you had to do was play the game, boy. All you had to do was throw the ball, boy. We can sell this auction block well, didn't we, boy? You didn't know you were on sale, boy. Didn't we tell you to just run, boy? Entertain us, boy. Win championships for us, boy. Stay in your place, boy. Don't you dare get these other, I mean, black men route up, boy. Didn't we pay you enough, boy? Why can't you just be satisfied, boy? Stand up and salute this flag, boy. Honor your allegiance to the system, boy. Didn't we give you enough money to entice you, boy? How dare you reject your master, boy? Didn't you like your name in lights, boy? Didn't we stroke your ego, boy? You see, all you had to do was play the game, boy. Keep dancing for us on Monday night, boy. Make us rich, boy. We don't care if you get hurt, boy. Our job is to break bucks like you, boy. Didn't you know boys like you come a dime a dozen, boy? We can't replace you with no thought, boy. Make sure our new boy is a control, boy. Thought you knew we didn't trust Negroes to be quarterback anyways, boy. We did you a favor, boy. How dare you turn your back on us, boy? If you are kneeling, it will be before us, boy. Ain't this game your God, boy? Don't you see how everyone else bows down before us, boy? Don't you know what we do to Negroes like you, boy? You see, back in the day, we let Negroes like you sway in trees, boy. Make an example out of you, boy. So other Negroes just stay in their place, boy. Don't you smell that strange fruit in the air, boy? All you had to do was just shut up, boy. We ain't got to kill you, boy. All we got to do is just silence you, boy. That's it. <laughs> that was the sledgehammer. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> um, we will move into our last question. All right. And it is, can you tell us a little bit about your recent book? So my recent book is Dear White Women. It's not you, it's me. I'm breaking up with you. Right. So I wrote it. It came out a little bit before COVID hit. Um, and I felt like, so 20, 2016 up until, you know, we're having this, I can't even say 53% without, like the hair goes on, up on the back of my neck. But we all know what that means, 53%, right? Right. Y'all know what it is, right? The 53% of white women that voted for Trump. We know this, right? And so, <laughs> so we were having this conversation. Okay, okay, we missed it. We, they didn't see it. We, we're going to get this conversation right this time. And, and uh, we didn't get it right. And I couldn't understand what, what am I not saying that I haven't already said? that you are still voting in such a way that's going to harm me. And I thought, we are women. And it's, here we are, it's Women's History Month, right? We are women. We're supposed to stand together 
and we're dancing together and it's awkward and you're stepping on my toes and I can't figure out what's not working here. And so I thought, you know what? Just going to break up with you. I'm done. And then, so I put this book out. You know, I'm just exaggerating the title. And then all these white women started messaging me, Hannah, are you really breaking up with us? And I said, <laughs> and I said no, I'm really not breaking up with you, but I got your attention. And I need you to work with me as a woman, not against me. Work with me. Can I close out with this woman's poem for woman's thing? We done. Of course, of course. Power. The capacity or ability to influence the behavior of others or the course of events. Power. Physical might. Power. The energy or motive force by which a physical system or machine is operated. Power. That thing that is in you, rumbling deep in your gut, flowing through your veins, making your heart beat. That feminine instinct that allows an ordinary woman to do extraordinary things. That allows a high school dropout to go back to school. That allows a woman beat down to leave an abusive relationship. That gives a woman the courage to say, I love you, but I love me a little bit more. That thing that says, not tomorrow, not when I turn 40, not when I retire, not because it's a new year, but today. Today is the day that I will muster up the power within me to take back everything that was stolen from me, to fulfill my dreams, to leave a job that doesn't pay me what I'm worth, to look cancer in the face and say, give me your best shot. Today is the day that I declare that diabetes doesn't have to be generational that the curse of molestation ceases with me, that I will stop living paycheck to paycheck, that I will become a role model for my children, that I recognize that if I'm good enough to sleep with, that I'm good enough to marry. Today is the day that the pity party comes to an end. The time for excuses is over. Today is the day that I declare that I will no longer live defeated. I will not dim my light in order for you to feel brighter, baby. I was born to shine. I am more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm a righteous woman that falls down seven times but gets up eight. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am a woman with unlimited possibilities and infinite potential. I possess the power to make daydreams reality, to make my life one that matters. And today is the day that I step into my destiny. I can be whatever I say I can be, and I am whoever I say I am. And today, today I say I'm strong, beautiful, wise, intelligent, authentic, revolutionary, destined for greatness. I am a woman. I am a woman that loves hard and strong. I am a woman that loves pink frilly things. I am a woman that struts in her stilettos and embraces her curves unapologetically. I am a woman that loves being a woman, being treated like a lady, but never attempt to paint me into a corner because baby wasn't meant to be put in a corner. My life cannot be defined by coloring and lines. I am 360 degrees of pure femininity, bolstered by his promises to me. And today is the day that we access our power. And by doing that, we give another woman the ability to grasp hers, to shine, to grow, to illuminate everything that is placed inside of her. You see someone right now, right at this very moment, is waiting on you to be all that you can be so that they can be all that they are destined to be. You, you are the key to someone's lock. You are strength personified. We are women and together we possess the ability to change policies, to change communities, and to change lives. And to finally exhale, ladies, and just breathe with ease. Today is the day that we access our power. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was a great segue question into um, what we'll move into. So we're going to now move into our um, the book signing. But first, I want to say Transylvania University thanks you so thank much you for, for this evening. And thank you to all who attended. Thank y'all.